Welcome, everybody. It's my great honor to be here at TEDx Kyoto today. And I'm Eli Ito, a researcher working on air traffic management. Uh, can you imagine what air traffic management is? No, maybe not. Um, how about a car traffic, driving a car? I think it's much, much familiar for all of us. When we drive cars, actually, I'm not the person who drives a car a lot. But, for example, when we drive cars, a driver firstly, for example, input the destination in the car navigation system, and uh, it automatically calculates the optimum route to the destination. And following this instruction, a driver brings us to the destination, obeying traffic rules and the manners and the laws. In the same way with driving a car, there exist many air laws on the sky, and following these air laws, pilot bring us to the destination, obeying traffic rules and manners and laws. One big difference between driving a car and controlling an aircraft is how to see surrounding traffic. For example, when we drive cars, we can check the other cars via windows or by mirrors and keep distance between the other cars. However, it's what pilot see from cockpit above cloud. Blue sky, empty. And actually, pilot can hardly see the other aircraft. So instead of pilot, air traffic controllers stay on the ground and they're checking all traffic on the radar display and gives instruction to the pilot in the air by voice communication. Um, yes, this is the one. Yes, this is the one. This screen shows uh, one of the simulated radar display, uh, which shows a liable traffic flow from the west to the to Tokyo International Airport. By seeing this radar display, actually the radar display updates traffic information every four seconds, but it's just fast forward. And actually, air traffic control see this traffic on the radar display and then gives instruction to the air, for example, a target airspeed and then altitude and the heading angle and so on. And by listening this voice, aircraft navigate us to the destination. So to speak, aircraft is blindfolded and the flying listening to aircraft, air, air traffic control's voice. However, in the future, controlling an aircraft getting much closer to driving a car. Yes, and this novel system, which remove blind hold from the aircraft, is Aircraft Surveillance Application System, ASAS. Yes, and this is an overview of the ASAS operation. Um, by applying ACERS, aircraft themselves broadcast the flight information in the air, including airspeed and position and altitude and so on, flight ID also, and the other aircraft can receive this traffic information and show this traffic information on the monitor in the cockpit display. So pilot can grasp the surrounding air traffic information in the air Um, one of my friends said, eh, it looks like a video game, should be. <laughs> <laughs> and by applying this ASAS operation, it is expected to achieve more environmental friendly operation because pilot can positively select the optimum load to reduce the fuel burn. And also it's expected that accurate pilot speed control increase the capacity of the alive air traffic by reducing air traffic control's workload. Before the implementation of this novel idea, questions to clarify are how to evaluate the safety in the future ASAS operation and how to identify any potential incidents in advance. To clarify these questions, we are working on a safety risk analysis on the ASAS operation um, since 2007. At that time, ASAS was a totally new idea in Japan, so 
we started our ASAS research with international research partners. Um, speaking of air traffic management research, it's really a minor research area all over the world. Um, in 2004, I was unexpectedly invited to give a talk in winter Slovakia. It was a really small town called Zilina, close to the borderline of the Pol Poland. Um, unexpectedly, I met a researcher working on this air traffic management field. And since then, it was a <laughs> coincidentally that I started to work on this international research activities on air traffic management research area. It's really nice that I can travel all over the world, you know, that I work on the international research. And I love traveling. However, international research collaboration demands me a huge effort to overcoming the differences of cultures and systems and languages and so on. But you know that I know these differences behind our international background brings us the huge, big breakthroughs and then stimulate our creative process. That's why I cannot stop working on it. And one of the big wow came from Bert Barker. And Bert is one of my best friends in Amsterdam. And also, he is a talented mathematician. One day in Amsterdam, I found Bert at the cafeteria and then he seemed very deep in thought uh, at the cafeteria and then we started to have lunch together and he suddenly asked me that, Ellie, can you believe infinity? Infinity? <laughs> I thought that at that time, maybe he was thinking about the origin of the earth or the space or love or he was in love seek or something. So I immediately answered, yes, of course, Beth, I believe in infinity. And then Beth said, Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, Ellie, I cannot believe the existence of the infinite numbers. Because if it exists, we cannot define this miracle. You Japanese girl here in Amsterdam, and I'm here to have lunch, and we coincidentally meet each other, and talking about the infinity, this miracle, rare event, we cannot define. If infinite number exists, infinite number of you and infinite number of me are talking about the infinity, it's weird. <laughs> Yes, but it's weird. <laughs> but anyway, you know that. Here's one of the impressive talk I heard, and this talk brought me the motivation to think about the stories behind the number, not only chasing down the number itself. And infinity, it's quite a huge number, but what is it? 5.0 times 10 power minus 9. What is it? No. Okay. It's 0 0.0000000005. It's quite a small number, you see. Actually, this shows a global standard of the mid-air collision risk of the aircraft. Yes, it's a small number. It should be really small. It means Mid-air collision should happen less than one time per two hundreds of millions of flight hours. This rarely happened event is called rare event. Um, people often ask me, why don't, you, why don't you try to make the collision risk zero? Yes, <laughs> but unfortunately in the reality, it hardly happened to define probability zero, even though it's small, it exists. So, what we are going to do is to design the future air traffic management system in order to make this safety risk as small as possible. Here is the approach we take uh, under the international collaboration with Netherlands based on the Topaz methodology. In our Topaz methodology, firstly, Flight operational experts 
including pilot and air traffic controllers, airline people and governmental staff and aviation scientists, discuss about a blueprint of the future air traffic management system. What types of future air traffic management system we want to achieve? Then researchers pick up all components in this future air traffic management system. For example, pilots exist and air traffic control exist. When we apply ASAS, we have new surveillance system and we use GPS information and then we need more display design or this type of thing. And mathematically, we describe this component behavior and interactions. And then we make mathematical models. And based on this model, we run a large scale simulation for hundreds of millions of flight patterns and count really small collision risk in the simulation. You know, it takes huge amount of computing time if we apply normal simulation method, but by applying specific mathematical method, we can get such a small collision risk during one night now. And then this simulation result shows that what components of or and combinations of components and interactions relate to the potential incident. And we feed back to the flight operation expert and they redesign the future ATM system and air traffic management system. And by repeating, repeating, repeating this process, we are going to make even better future air traffic management system in the future. Um, through this safety analysis work, what I learn is incidents happen as a result of a sequence of rare events. For example, unfortunately during flight, aircraft system fails, and unfortunately human being makes mistake, and unfortunately strong wind hit the aircraft. This unfortunate, the sequence of rare events cause incident in the worst case. So it's real, really difficult to find only main one cause of the incident. And human beings make mistakes, hardware fails, and software includes bugs, and operational procedures never cover all emergency behaviors. Everything never be perfect, even though the risk is really small. So I think the next challenge we can do is to find a way to break a chain of rare events. I learned the important thing is not to believe the safety too much, but not to be afraid of potential incident too much, but not to stop reading the stories behind such a small risk of the potential incident. This figure shows the future aviation blueprint published by one of the aviation communities in the United States. In this figure, it's spectacular that, you know, flying wing and unmanned air vehicle and space aircraft arrive at the same airport and the future aviation will be more, much more effective and safer and cleaner and greener. Yeah, it's seemed like a kind of science fiction at the moment, but who knows what future brings to us. It's just for the record, but please remember, behind these spectacular views in future aviation, we safety analysts learn a large simulation and counting the small probability of potential risk and reading the stories behind the risk if it happens and also it happens, and it happens, and then it happens, maybe it also happens. Never ending story we are reading in a dark simulation room. <laughs> and I believe it's the way we go. Thank you very much.